Sister Susie. Ah! I'd like to give a big cherry red TV welcome to Neville Atkinson from Punishment of Luxury, who's here to chat about, about the band's history in advance of the release of Puppet Life, a five CD box set comprising the band's entire catalogue. So welcome, Neville. Okay, thanks, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, it's it's uh, a pleasure. Cool. Um, so let's take you right back to what Gateshead in the mid 1970s. Yeah. Tell us about you know, your youth and your earliest musical memories, I suppose, and influences. I, was very, I used to get involved in all sorts of experimental uh, music and I did, um, I was very influenced by the, the American scene and some of the English adventurous sort of music and uh, also classical musicians like Edgar Varese, who m did Music Concrete, hence Escapades recording music in the road and worked out how can I play guitar with that and ended up plugging into a, um, a mainframe computer stroke synthesizer with a guitar and a guy making up a trapezoid and an interface in my, when I was 17, 18, so quite a lot of experimentation. And uh, a time working with a guy called Rob Meek, who was a guy who originally sent the, photograph, uh, the postcard of uh, Punishment of Luxury. And uh, yeah, my musical influence is New York Dolls, I remember hearing them. Rob used to bring me his records from range from, ranging from the original Velvet Underground, Andy Warhol, uh, outtakes and New York Dolls and stuff. Uh, and, um, and one friend who I used to jam with in the morning before he went to work, which is an unusual time, you know, we had curried scrambled eggs and uh, <laughs> we used to play music. Um, it, because, of our, because of my interest in classical music, um, mainly Bartok, he said, have you heard of Robert Fripp, uh, of King Crimson? And I said, no, so he played me some of his music and I thought, that's really good, that's really great expressive stuff. I mean, I was still in formative times, you know. And um, yeah, that was a very good experience. I'd, I'd been to India by then, I'd studied music, sitar and I uh, managed to get a jam in Kandahar, which I don't think you could do that now, uh, which was a great time with this like Muller guy. Is this mid-1970s? Mid 70s, yeah, 70s, yeah. early 70s, 72, early 70s. 73. Okay. Yeah, and so uh, that was a great experience, working with people, learning about people in a very dynamic way. And eventually, um, when I came back, after I'd studied sitar and Eastern music, uh, rather than go to the Western schools, um, I came back and looked towards, well, how can I express this in some way? And um, yeah, so that, that was some of the formative times. And I did have a technical uh, session with Robert Fripp, um, who showed me guitar mechanics, which was uh, an amazing experience. A very humble guy, very brilliant musician, obviously, and great artist. And I learned the discipline of the hand technique, which was a good thing, because I'd learned the sitar and now I was embarking on guitar. So I've had some, I think, some interesting foundations of learning, you know, in my youth, so. And you were also involved quite heavily, I think, in theatre at the time. In theatre, yeah. Tell us about, and about this that is then. where Rob Meek comes in again. Um, Rob formed a, a theatre company called Hourglass Theatre. And Hourglass Theatre was, uh, was like a community theatre. We used to perform in pubs. And we used to add music sometimes. And he was very innovative. Rob was a very innovative guy. And um, yeah, and we also produced the first street press. We produced our own press. We're doing from this place in Walker Terrace. I think I've mentioned it in the notes, just touched on it. We have um, our first local community street press. Quite adventurous stuff. And um, yeah, and also doing theatre and then working music in the theatre. I think I did my very first musical one when I came back from my tours when I was about 20, uh, called Suno, which is a big experiment with music and theatre. It wasn't like West End production, it was like on the edge, but it was a great learning experience. And Rob was very instrumental in encouraging me to push these boundaries, you know. Was, was there quite a, did you feel like there was quite a vibrant scene in Gateshead and Newcastle at the time in the North East? There was a lot of music going on. There's a lot of stuff. I, uh, initially, I formed a band called Kitch 22. Um, which was a combination of theatre and of music. We've got an actor called, uh, called Annie from live theatre in Newcastle and she was doing vocals and some dramatic things where I was more like engineering 
music, musical stuff and working on visuals. And uh, that, that was quite a big band, about seven of us. And what a great time it was. Again, it was, I was starting to write, learn to write then, and then play some covers like Wild Thing and all that sort of stuff, you know. What a great time. Um, but we moved into a, a different period where, when I ended into, uh, whereas I got a postcard from Rob. He went, he went to live in Liverpool. And he said that I fancy going there. And I went there and I thought, it, it didn't work for me, it worked for him. But when he was there, he said, I've been to the Walker Gallery. I lived in Walker Terrace. We lived in Walker Terrace, so I kept the base going there. And he sent this postcard of The Punishment of Luxury by Giovanni Segantini. And I thought, hey, that's a great name for a band. <laughs> now he said, the name's too long, too long. I thought, nah, it's a, it's a great name. The meaning of the picture isn't really what the band's about because that was something about the punishment of lust. I think it was a, a, a wrong translation from the Latin. It was punishment lux, which was lust, mm. not lux light. And then somebody just put, oh, it must be luxury. So all these words got a bit confusing, but the word itself, punishment luxury, I thought, great name. So that's where the name started anyway. And then I, uh, yeah. And uh, I think the band formed in late 1976. Very late um, 19, had, 1976. Had, uh, was, was punk already something on the radar for you or were you, would, was that a kind of interesting coincidence? Well, yeah, it was a coincidence really. It was coming up, we'd heard of bands like um, The Clash um, and The White Rides and all, all the different bits of music that were coming on and some really great artists coming out. Of course, the Sex Pistols all coming up. But which was very challenging. It was very political and it was, it was inspiring. I was on this journey, exploring, looking at stuff, and then this stuff comes along and I think, well, that's very good, that's really good as well. So I took it as an, as an inspiration. I didn't want to emulate it because it was already happening. I wanted to be part of where I was, I was wanting to take the music, you know. But I saw it was a good influence. I saw a lot of energy in it. Of course, New York Dolls, they, they came up with a lot of stuff. The, the, the uh, Velvet Underground and uh, other bands like that, they all came up with uh, some interesting influences as well. So maybe tell us about the other band members in, oh, yeah. in Punishment of Luxury. Tell us about them. Yeah, definitely. Well, um, at Walker Terrace, we, because we're very much linked with theatre and doing stuff, uh, our, we were still running our theatre company, Hourglass Theatre, or Rob's theatre company, Hourglass Theatre. I was part of that. Uh, we had a party where, whereby Rob said, oh, I'd like to get some tour experience with a company called Mad Bongo and at that time you could get grants from the Arts Council that actually supported local theatre and political theatre and stuff like this and um, yeah so I had this party and along came Mad Bongo uh, and in tour was Brian and Brian and I had already started the idea the concept of the band did a few experimental gigs and stuff but realised that if I was going to be involved in anything theatrical visual dynamic you know it needed some massive part of the jigsaw to work. And after just talking with Brian, uh, there's an instant chemistry, you know, whereas Brian was a, a writer, a uh, great singer, and great performer. Uh, I've seen some of the stuff we've done before. Uh, well, we decided to just, we, we, got, we were employed by Mad Bongo to be the band that backed the performance. And which instruments did you play, respectively, you guys? Bass you and guitar. So you were bass and he was guitar? No, he, he was singing, he was doing theatre. Yeah. Uh, but we were also acting and then rushing back to do music as well. So oh, OK. We're, so we're musicians and we're doing a bit of acting and stuff, mm. you know. But Brian had some lead parts in that. Mm. But writing songs, so we got involved in some working together on songs, like Rock and Pro was one song. Kids Gone Wrong, which is a song. Sometimes I've, re I've done the lead role on it, but then I had to do the guitar. But the working together, we realised that we, we had a very good working relationship. We could, we bounced off each other. The conflicts were good. There was conflicts, but the conflicts were good, were healthy. So that was the core, as far as you're concerned, in the, in the writing, the songwriting team? For, in the, in the, the th yeah, in the idea. I mean, I used to write a lot on my own, Brian used to write a lot on my own, mm. and sometimes he might come with a ballad. Mm. For example, Brain Bomb. And, I'd, I'd applied the music of Brain Bomb, which is quite fast and raucous. And, uh, and, and it, started, it no longer became a ballad, it became a very different song. But that was something completely unplanned and just came together through preparing to listen to one another. 
Fred Brown said, it's a ballad. And I said, no, it's this song. So I said, let's try it with him. That works. And that's when good stuff happens, you know. So that was mm. some of the high points that were hard working together. So who else did you recruit then to make it a proper functioning band that could go out and play live? Yeah, well, because I played bass um, and guitar, uh, as the, for example, Puppet Life was an octave sort of thing. Um, I, uh, I realised that I guess someone who was a really good player, very solid player. So we recruited Jimmy Gyro, Jimmy Davis. He played in the club scene at that time. And uh, we saw him at a few gigs and we managed to hijack him mm. and just say, hey, come and do this. And he played the stuff and he loved it and he wanted to break out of it. And, and mm. he joined us and he became a real big foundation for the sound. He's a very strong player, he's very, very reliable. If everything fell apart and all the lights went off and all the leads came out, he'd still be there, you know. And it all went back on, he'd still be there at that right beat. And initially we had a drummer called Les Denham. Um, he was a great guy, but uh, in time we, we worked with a guy called Jeff Armstrong as well. He was a very, very good drummer, had some great drummers. But it was my schoolboy mate, Stephen, who I used to play with just guitar on him. We used to do gigs just guitar on him in the early days. Uh, drums and guitar, which I think people do now as well. He became the solid link, so it became the four of us. There was an extra guitarist as well um, called Mal Eltringham, who was another local guy, it's all local guys. Um, he was a great player. Everyone was an individual in their own right. So to keep that individuality together, it, I think the music cemented that and the, mm. the dynamics of playing uh, brought that together in a very good way. You know. So tell us about your early shows then. Can you remember maybe even your first show as Punishment of Luxury? Or? First show with Brian, myself, mm -hmm. and I think it was Mala and, uh, and Jeff Armstrong was at the Blue Bell in Gateshead. And that was a really big experience because I know Brian and I had toured before in some quite wild places up in Glasgow and up on the coast and places like this um, in the theatre sense where it was more or less theatre and music. This was now music with some dramatic with, it's a different, different idea. And it was a big experiment. So I went down to the Blue Bell and it was a chaos happening through like a Wild West fight going on. And, and I think the angelic upstarts were playing there as well. So we went into this and said, okay, let's go for it. And the very first gig we played was, was together with Grant, was at that place. It was, wow. It was a great, I remember it. It was all black. Um, although it was quite rough, it was, if you could win that audience, you could do something mm. because it was a bit like the, not like the Blues Brothers where they threw the bottles at the, <laughs> but it was, it was touch and go, you know, if they didn't mm. like you, they'd let you know. Newcastle and Gateshead audiences, if they don't like you, they would just say, you know, Off and you we, we won them over. So that was a very encouraging mm. foundation for us, you know, so we just said, let's go for this, you know. That's what we played Puppet Life. Yeah. Right. And when was that gig? Can you remember? It was, I think, 1970. The end of 75, 76, around about 76. Wow, okay. So fast 76, forward... 76, 77, roughly around about that time, yeah. Sure, yeah. Fast forward a year or so and you end up signing a deal with Small Wonder. That's right, so yeah. maybe tell us how that happened. Well, Brian and I went round the... Um, a lot of the record companies at that time um, who give us uh, differing advice. <laughs> a lot of it was like, you have full-time jobs, lads. That music's weird. Who's going to listen to that? That's what we do, you know, President Records, a long lecture about how to write pop music and stuff. And, uh, uh, and, and it was almost, if, if we could have given up then, we could have given up then. I think Virgin Records are very interested. Um, and a few of the record companies later on got involved, but uh, we, we heard about Small Wonder and Pete Stennett. They only heard that was his name later. But Pete Stennett was, uh, he had a vision, you know, we went in there, we knew what we wanted. We did songs like, uh, we played a puppet life, The Demon, and I think it's Let's Get Married, and You're So Beautiful, which were very, I think, original songs. And he just put it on, you heard it, it was just, he placed Hall Street, I think 162 Hall Street in uh, Walthamstow. And it was a rainy night, I thought, oh God, you know, I've got to get the the bus or the train back of car. I think you could travel quite cheaply by train then. And uh, he put it on, he just said, yep. He said, that's it, I want that. I said, really? He said, yeah, and the, within a week. Puppet well, Life, that yeah, was the one. Puppet Life, he said, mm. I like, that's it. And we're in Berry Street Studios and recording it, you know. 
he was like right on the money straight away he didn't mess around he didn't talk much he just said 50 50 deal go for it mm. and that's what he wanted and, and i always appreciate that sort of uh, commitment to his own decision making and massive encouragement to us and he said i won't do any more he said i won't do any more with you i said oh he said because you've probably got a deal i said oh, that's encouraging he said, but you wouldn't know about that yet because you're probably not interested. He, he, said, he was quite a visionary philosophical guy, and he still is. And, um, that re- I mean, that record to me has an amazing energy, yeah. uh, but also the, the interesting time signature because it's got that quite awkward, yeah. it's very not, not a punk record. It's, it's, no, it's definitely not a punk what, record. what we now call a definitive sort of post punk record. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. Where, where did that come from? Was that because you brought lots of different influences, do you think, to the the party with the groups sound? Uh, I think so. Well, I wrote it on bass guitar. The bum, 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 dum, 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 dum. And it was just like a marionette sort of thing. But it was, a, I think it was a, a thought about how encased, how trapped we can become. Like, for example, if you wake up in the morning and you can't really do what you really want to do, or you're fearful of that, then it's a type of oppression. It isn't just like being physically trapped. It's a mental thing. And that's and, and you're, you're encased, and it's how to break free from that. And and the, the music seemed to fit. And I was experimenting, jamming, and then thought, well, that works. It's just one of those things. Sometimes songs can come very, very quickly. Mm-hmm. And that came, so I wrote basic lyrics. I went to Brian and said, Brian, what do you think? Listen, of course, the puppet Brian's amazing sort of like movement on puppet. Then we all did it at that time. We could play, sing, play, and do the things. We need a lot of energy uh, because we thought it was all big visual effects. So I thought that's a really, really good, good way of trying to express something. And it wasn't just the idea of being like marionettes. It was like being a puppet within a system. So there's a political aspect to it. Hence the last line there. Our bodies can take no more. The fascist always ends up on the floor. Yeah. And still, we still believe that. You know, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a predictive uh, not prophecy, but I, idea that um, good will outcome, good will, will overcome dark yeah. and negative forces. So the song came out of that, but also in order to convince anyone that it was true, that would be energy. And, and that was it. But the song came through through that sort of idea. Yeah. So that, that single obviously made a bit of an impact, got critical acclaim. And you ended up doing quite a number of tours and supporting different bands. A lot maybe, of gigs, maybe yeah. tell us a few about some of those those tours you did and the groups you played with. Oh yeah, we did we did we did a ton of gigs. I mean, what constantly doing gigs. I remember then it was hard to hire a van because if you're a musician, I think you're on the same status as criminal. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> no, seriously, you couldn't hire a, you couldn't hire get higher purchase unless you paid full cash up front. So we had to get someone who had a, a work a, a PAYE link. They do it to pay for us, then we used to pay them. And we always used to do the tours up and down and the four transits. We played with loads and loads of people, uh, especially in London. I uh, remember we, we did some gigs with Joy Division. You know, a great band, you know, they're like us, we are getting about 30 or 40 quid or whatever. We were making, no, then we are actually making some money, we are just about to stay alive, but it was quite tough, but we loved the gigging. And um, we eventually did all the clubs, all the way around. Um, Mainly, it was a big club scene and the 100 Club, the Marquee, we did the Marquee four times or so. We did, we did some great, great times through there. And then we eventually got, when we got signed, we did Redden Festival and, and, and other stuff. And the Leeds, um, Sci Fi, which was a great thing. John Keenan, a great visionary, did that gig. But remember when the early days we did Eric's at Liverpool and orchestral maneuvers in the dark used to support us, <laughs> which is quite funny now because they, they've I see it as a tribute. I don't, uh, they brought a, a, an album, Punishment and Luxury. Of course, yeah. I thought, well, the only reason this could be, because it always used to be a support, they've extended the support. <laughs> so, Good way of looking at so, it. So, thanks, lads. Yeah. Thank you very much. And, yeah, keeping um, the name out. They're a great band, anyway. But I'm just saying, it's interesting to play with these bands in, in their formative years. And Human League, we did gigs with them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and just seeing there was no backing tapes on it was just like they just had to go and do the business and they're great bands mm. uh, all, all of them are very very good bands joy division i particularly like them you know cover voltaire that you name it, all the bands we played with were hanging around in the stages uh, in tiny dressing rooms 
And the Nashville was a very good gig, which was, of course, was on the album. We managed to. That's right, some recordings at Nashville, yeah. yeah Previously that was, unreleased. Yeah, that was great. I mean, that was the time of. Um, it was, uh, there was 999. They were on the same label as uh, we did. Uh, uh, Toya Wilcox did the gigs and um, the adverts. Uh, they did some great gigs and Susie and the Banshees, all these people. And there's a state, the, the dressing room was tiny. I remember it was like, trying to, in fact, sometimes you had to get out of the dressing room to get in, and then when they left it, you get back in. But it was a fantastic venue, yeah. a great gig. But we did all that stuff and we really grew in that period before we recorded the album. We grew then, a lot of people would come and see us live, and we're then building and working on songs and stuff like that, you know. And of course, John Peel sessions emerged before that period as well, yeah. before and after, yeah. So then you signed to United Artists. How did that happen? Yeah, well, we we're very pleased to sign to United Artists because I said Virgin were very interested uh, because we met um, XTC. But they had very big deals. They were big in the sense you had to produce a lot of music, <laughs> like five albums that we thought, that's a lot of stuff. Great company. And then Charisma were interested because they saw our band as something akin to Genesis, which we didn't. Although there is some link in that was visual, but it's not the same sort of music or whatever. So I know it was more money, it was a different sort of deal. But a guy called Tim Chaxfield, um, who's, uh, he, had a, he was a great guy. He, he comes to just saw us and he just said, look, just, I just want this, this is great. And we're gonna offer you a deal and put you with a good, really good producer. And I think I mentioned in the notes, um, uh, Eno was around at that time, sort of stuff. but they suggested Mike Howlett from Gong uh, and Strontium 90, I think it was. Strontium 90, yeah. Strontium 90, yeah. And I thought, well, he's, he seems a pretty cool bloke. You know, we've got no idea what these guys are like and go in the studio with a producer. Never done that before, no idea what to expect. So, yeah, we got, um, so we did a deal with them because they seemed to have the vision. They had a lot of bands on the, on the label then, like Buzzcocks, Stranglers. Jam, Dr. Feel Good. Uh, that's how the buzz got. Every, everyone I think was happening seemed to be on that. They seemed to have grabbed a lot of what was going on. They seemed to grab the whole feeling. And uh, yeah, yeah, 999 they were on as well. And uh, yeah, they had a lot of bands. And so we thought it's a good label to go, go with. So that would be the most um, in tune label to yeah. go with. So we just went. Okay, maybe to tell us about how the Laughing Academy, the album, was made then. How did that come about? Well, obviously we'd been we heard writing quite a bit, playing and writing and stuff like this. And um, as I said, when, when we decided to go into the studio, we'd been touring quite a lot, so we're very tight. And um, we'd discuss some of the musics with Mike Howlett and a guy called Aldo Bocca, who was on the desk. Very, very, very switched on guy, very, very creative guy. And I said, right, okay, we've had a 20 minute chat. Go and do it. Right. And which, sorry, which studio was this? Oh, Eden, Eden Studio. Oh, Eden, which was a Eden famous studio. studio. Yeah. yeah, okay. It was, uh, end of it, it was suspended. Or it was in a rural area, but it was suspended floors. We went in Eden mm. Studios and recorded it. And, um, I think there's some mastering done in Ad Vision, but it was recorded there. And they said, just, yes, in the studio after we chatted, they said, well... Off you go. Off you go. And I went, okay. He said, just do it. So just, we just well, like, like did the set more or less. Mm. So he captured the vibe and everything full on. I used a JC 120, I was 160 then. And uh, we just went for it and recorded it. And it was like with the, with the lead vocals and we just sung on stuff. But they said, we'll take them out if they're not good, whatever. But I captured a terrific amount. So we recorded a lot of that was straight down. There was obviously overdubs and things later, which things didn't work. But generally it was a live take on a lot of it, and which was great. Because he sensed, well, you've got the energy now, you've got the drive now. I'm not gonna kill that by fragmenting it. And he, he was a very uh, energetic and um, talented guy, Mike Howlett. He, he knew how to, he, well, he's a musician as well, he knew how to get the vibe, and he, I think he certainly captured it. So how long was the album, how long were the sessions then? Was it like all over in a few days or? I think they were a week and a bit, a week and a bit because yeah. it was overdubs, then we went to mm -hmm. Art Vision and then he worked out the sequence, I think, for the end of Laughing Academy. 
Mm. And he said, I've got an idea. And Jimmy came up this beat, dum bum 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 And he put, put a sequencer thing in there, like a drum beat. So he started to work with us and he started to get involved doing things, you know. And um, yeah, he, he's innovative ideas were great. He just wanted to bring some production ideas to it, but not overproduce it. Because yeah. he knew we were a live band. And we wanted to be able to reproduce it live, which we're trying to do now, I think. Mm. Trying to do the best of it now. So listening back to the album, as you, I'm sure you have been, working on the box set, are there any particular songs you're most proud of? Or recordings you're most proud of on the album? Yeah, um, the message. Message for me is very dynamic, it's very Germanic. <laughs> and I was inspired, uh, even though it didn't sound like Beethoven, the like Beethoven inspires a lot of the sort of, sort of strength and the, the chords and also the sequences. And um, I do like uh, Obsession. Uh, because the song brought together Brian with the reply, the, the mind and the thought. And that was a song which was very touch and go in the early days because it was about a rapist and the mind of a rapist was a horrible thing. Um, but Ron just said, raping is bad because we used to do lots of chants. And then we thought, well, we won't do that because of. But let's see how we can dramatise this and let's see what we can get into the mind of the person. And of course, it's, the, it's how they fail in the end. Mm. It's this horrible collapse of the human condition. And I think it's captured pretty well. It's quite mm. a traumatic, but some, some of the best songs are quite a bit edgy. Absolutely. Uh, you know, we still try to do it live. I think we mm. tried to do it the last time. Mm. Didn't realise how much you had to do play, sing, and everything else, a lot to do, but I like, mm. I like those two. So there are three singles from the album. So yeah. there's Engine of Excess, Secrets, and Laughing Academy, the title track. Yeah. Were you very much involved with United Artists and how the album and the singles were marketed and how they were chosen? Were, were you in control, did you feel? Or, um, or was it something where you left the record company to their own devices? Well, they just said, well, what can you come up with? And I think it was Engine of Excess, and, and that was a good one. And, uh, and there was Jellyfish. We, we wanted to have an A side, a B side, and a C side. <laughs> and I think that's because of a double groove idea. Mm. And, and I think that's when we came at Loggerheads with their marketing. They said, well, you know, you can't do that because the DJ can't choose. And I said, that's, that's always a good thing. And they had engine of excess, but then they decided to flip it and put jellyfish out. So it sold quite a bit, quite a lot of records, but half and half, which would defeat the purpose. Mm -hmm. But I thought the seaside would have been a good version. So I had to do an X side and the seaside. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, and Secrets, I think, was a, was a really good song. It was took away, it's more like Rocky, but Brain Bomb was the, the favourite one, you know, on that one. Yeah. Mm. And Laughing Academy, I thought, was obviously the single from the, the album, with Baby Don't Jump, which was a bit of a... Uh, about the system, the record company system. We've got a bit paid off then, you know. Mm. A bit of a statement then, I think, so, yeah. Yeah, because after that, I, you, maybe you can tell us, but it, as I understand it, you went into the sort of process of starting to work on the second record. That's then, right, yeah. Then you were unceremoniously dropped. So we tell were. us about how that happened. We were. Well, there's two things happening at that time. I think United Artists won and the throws have been taken over by EMI. So it was a different way of thinking coming in there. And um, a little while we were recording stuff and, and, and uh, like Damaging Man and different music and songs, which we thought, because well, we needed to grow a bit. We needed to have another six months, nine months of a year working together. Uh, but they didn't want to have that time and, uh, and they asked about politics and idea, all sorts of strange stuff. Oh, yeah. You've got to be honest about what you think. Um, but we just met this, this bloke, we were expecting us to meet Tim. And we're going to talk about the next day. Tim Traxfield. Tim yeah. Traxfield, yeah, because my wife's in love with the polar bear was going to be the single, which, which we all liked. So the got. first single off the second album, is it? Yeah, it was going to be that. And then we're going to work on new material, go a different direction. They had ideas. Mm -hmm. The publishing company, I think Brian Hopkins uh, from Screen Gems, was suggesting doing more music like Laughing Academy. And I said, well, that's got to grow. You know, it's got to, that's got to develop. We need time to write. And I just don't think they give us the time to write and develop. Uh, with their support. Mm. And I think, I think someone brought up the term, we're not suitable for today's modern market. Right. You know, okay. which I thought, ah, uh, ah. Uh. And this bloke, who I'd never seen before, came in, he was looking at the floor and just said, you yeah, know, and he made that statement. And then he said, I'm gonna make a coffee. And he said, well, so what do you mean? And the next minute he said, oh, that's it. I thought it was such a, such a bad way to treat people. I mean, if they're mm. gonna drop me, drop, but do it, do it in a nice way. But um, yeah, so we're sitting in the foyer at the bottom there, 
thinking what had happened, you know. And it was quite a blow. It just like mm. pulled the rug underneath you, you know. And I think they were going more, you, you were tried going to get more commercial singly sort of stuff. Mm. And we were going more into deeper, more interesting stuff, like political, spiritual, all sorts of things. It was a journey. Because mm. sometimes you do a really good album, the second one might not be so good, but the third one might be good. But that's why you need a record company behind you to take you on that journey, because it's a creative journey, we're not machines, you know. Mm. So that was unfortunate, but we just had to keep keep going after that. So how did you keep going? Did you just keep gigging? And then of course you sold some of the sessions from the second album, or those gigantic yes. days, as to presumably just to sort of generate some funds. Try, right? try and generate some funds, but mm. yeah, basically just gig, just keep gigging and writing new material, which we did. And, um, you know, and a lot of that was very different. That was part of our transition, you know. And uh, like Gigantic Days and uh, Revolution by Number, some of the stuff in there. And I think maybe the thought was a bit political, you know. You know, about a bit, I think someone said, you know, a bit close to the bone. <laughs> and I suppose the real punk thing had gone then, wasn't it? You know, it wasn't, but we weren't punk, we weren't shouting anarchy. It was more like thinking things through, you know. Uh, but that's the way it went, you know, for us in, in the, that commercial realm, you know. So did you, was there ever a time when you did sort of take a break or did you just keep gigging all the way through to signing to Red Rhino in 1983? Was yeah, that, we, we kept... Was that a constant process of just keep kept, chipping away? I kept writing, kept chipping away because you have to keep going, you know, you have to, you've got to believe in what you're doing. And um, even though it can be quite difficult, if you focus on the negative stuff, you won't, you won't get through to the positive things. So you just got to keep working at your, your music, even through dry periods, and then be inspired, and then try and get it recorded, and then just try and get it out. And, and Red Rhino came along, and we did seven, which was accumulation of coming out of the battlefield. And I think I still think there's some very good songs on there. And of course, yeah, you've discovered the unreleased single, which we never knew what happened with Red Rhino. It was like it was going to be on. Someone's just found a test pressing of it, mm. the album with it on, but in, in the, the What's the song? Doubting Thomas. That's right. Doubting Thomas, yeah. And that was, a, that was in a, a nine, we went back the nine, four time signatures with melodic riffs. So it was a dance from outer space, really. It was like very commercial sounding. But somehow it didn't get on the album. There's some confusion, I think, with Red Rhino at that time because. They were dealing with a lot of stuff and getting people over, getting stranded in the studio, all sorts of stuff was going on eventually that they went out. But we're very grateful for them putting that sort of music out. And know. Doubting Thomas appears on the new Puppet Life box set for the first time ever. First time ever it's went out there, Wonderful. you know, and, and, and I'm very happy about that. I think it's a great song. Absolutely. But it got lost in the translation. You know, uh, but Red Rhino did support us and they did their best to try and... Yeah, I think it was an indie hit at the time. It, I think it, it, it sold well. It did well, well yeah. yeah. It, it, it did well, I think. Uh, and that's where we went back and then, you know. But then your next release on Red Rhino is essentially a, like a solo project under the name Neville Luxury. That's what, right. What, what was the thinking? Was that, had the band kind of fragmented? Yeah, or? it's had a bit then by then because Brian oh. had, uh, and, and I, although we uh, were back again, though, we would have had musical and ideological differences with things. Mm -hmm. And um, I think Brian remained with EMI, and he did a song, um, La Mer, with a band called Punching Holes, um, who are a very good band, uh, comprising of uh, Tim Jones, the guitarist, and a guy called Richard on keyboards, who was a part, in, a part of uh, uh, an excellent band. And um, Emerson, a guy called Mick Emerson on the drums, uh, and, uh, and they did a band called Punching Holes. Mm -hmm. And they, they were signed to EMI for a period of time. Brian's just been talking to me recently because they, they're going to re-release... The album, right. And the album, it's right. about five or six albums of songs right. on there, like uh, mm -hmm. Mad Mother and... Um, what, what one is it? And uh, Spots on the Sun. So, songs like this, which yeah. are really, really good. And uh, Sour Face Valerie. Some mm. great stuff, but it was, this was done after we split. I think so, about but you, did you then make Feels Like Dancing Wartime? Yes. So who did you recruit for that? And how, was, how did you feel that was different in, in the sense of what you'd done previously with... Well, what, it was a breakaway, it was a bit of an experiment. So mm. I, I worked with Steve. Uh, I couldn't get Jimmy at the time he was doing stuff, so I got a guy called Mark um, on, on the bass. And, uh, and Davey Thompson did guitar, young... Rocker guy, you know, a very enthusiastic guy, and he just said, let's go and do it. And Red Rhino said, yeah, let's go and do it. So we, 
we recorded some tracks in, in Alaska Studios, mm -hmm. which is under Waterloo Bridge. Yeah, it's a famous, train, train. famous studio, yeah. Yeah, Alaska Studios, it's good fun. It's, it's, mm -hmm. And Pat Collier, uh, the vibrators, he, yeah. he did the mixing on that. Mm -hmm. And Aldo Bocca came along and mixed a couple of tracks, The Dragon mm -hmm. and The Prisoner. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so very happy about that. Mm -hmm. And it was a good breakaway, you know. But it's quite a long road if you're a musician. You need to get finance, you need to stay alive and all this sort of stuff, you know. But you've mm -hmm. got to keep your vision. If you believe it, you've got to do it. And mm -hmm. find a way of doing it, you know. That's, mm -hmm. that's my thing. But Brian went off and did his thing and it was great. So that's, that's, that was why there's a big gap. Yeah, yeah. Because Brian went off and did his stuff and he also did some acting and things like this. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, the band that the guy Richard was in called The Shaman. I think it was like a, a synth pop sort of band. Yeah, a Scottish band, yeah. Yeah, but he was in there, he was one that he went off and did stuff. And he's got back together. He's doing our merchandise now. Oh. So it's all like coming back together. It's like this. Full circle. Uh, yeah, he's doing he's doing he's doing our merchandise, which is uh, it, it, and he's helping with that. And but also he's helping bring Brian re-release the old punching hole stuff. Which right. is due to be out December, something like that in the future. Right. Yeah, it's good stuff. So the box set also includes recordings various in times when you reconvened. So the first the yeah. first time seems to be in the late eighties with the High Alien project. The High Alien, so. I was still experimenting with that, and I had to get together. I've got together with a couple of guys, um, Eddie Eddie Hall and uh, Tony Wright. Uh, the two two guys who are very uh, very accomplished musicians, and I was experimenting with very, very different sort of ideas and things like this. And I'd also managed to invent uh, this means of interfacing computers, because I was always interested in interfacing computers, not synth pop, and bouncing around, but creating stuff, you know. And uh, so I managed to get a patent for this glove which could interface computers and then record the single called Alien Contacts. So I put, put it around a concept, you know. I wasn't looking over the shoulder for aliens, but it was an alien concept and concept. So I worked around that theme mm. and worked, did, did a lot of live gigs. And uh, I did a live show in the Covent Garden Piazza with the guys at the Starlight Express in the lunch hour. So do you fancy skating on here? I'll buy you a pint. I went, pint? <laughs> as much as that. But yeah, we, we just had a lot of fun doing stuff. So I was experimenting quite a bit in that. Mm. And, uh, and there's quite a bit from the Alien theme, which is on the album some stuff that no one's ever heard before. Mm. And um, yeah, which we recorded, I think in uh, Newcastle, in Spectro, there's quite a lot of recordings from there. We released a single from there on Puck Records, mm. but not released as a, as a full album, you know, right. but that's on, that's, on the, that's on the box set now. Absolutely. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. And then you seem to kind of retreat a bit from the public gaze in terms of, of making music. Presumably yeah. just getting on with life and, and everything else that we all do. It is. Um, I, I mean, I think my last meaningful gig was after the Alien stuff. I did, managed to get a Glastonbury gig mm. to try and present, which was great fun. I did it with um, Beverly Martin, did a gig there, and she was doing that right. heavy stuff, great stuff. So it was mm. like small, when the smaller stages were there, you know, weren't the big stage. But it was, it, was, it was a good gig to do. But then, of course, I got married. Yeah, they had kids. I thought, well, I've got to make some more money than this. So I... Uh, had to retreat a bit. I didn't start writing. Mm. I didn't start writing, but I couldn't do as much. I wasn't as... Uh, as active, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm. As, uh, but I still did gigs. I did a few, so I did solo gigs and the mm. band, I couldn't do it all. You've, life changes, mm. life changes. And good, well so, because they're lovely kids. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it's great. But yeah. then you come back in 2012, you make another little mini album called Five. So you'd obviously, that must have, you had to still have the <sighs> hunger to make more music, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, because I've been still been writing stuff and experimenting, you know, but you do need a focus. You know, when you write, you need a focus uh, and you need an inspiration. And that time I've been through a difficult time in life. I was living on an island in Norfolk uh, on a boat and I was into starting writing a book. And then that's, that's become a massive resource for future stuff. And um, learning about myself. Really, it sounds a bit corny, but you do. And, uh, and developing my writing skills, you know. And I got a call uh, via a friend called Vicky, who, who was a friend of Sue, who was the road manager at the time, uh, or both Scottish, saying, hey, Jimmy's gonna have a 50th birthday. 
I said, oh, Jimmy, oh, yeah, yeah. Because I've been right out of touch. I live in Norfolk and they were out there. I says, oh, yeah, cool. Would you like to come up? And I said, yeah. Or would you like to play? I said, tell you what. <laughs> or the band. I says, oh, they're all into doing it. Others said, yeah. I says, oh, that's, yeah, yeah. I was going through a difficult time. And I thought, what a fantastic journey out. <laughs> so I focused on that. We got together. It was a bit earlier than the... 2012 was the outcome of the workings before, the music before, a bit earlier than that. Mm. Uh, 2009, 10, roughly about that. So we got together and we all met together and uh, met at Vicky's, who was our main rehearsal area, and um, went through the set again for after so many, so many, many years and um, clicked. Oh, Click yeah, only had, a, had an hour's oh, rehearsal yeah. and went through a gig and it sort of worked out. Wow, what? Must have done a lot of gigs beforehand and it was really good fun, really good mm. fun. And I enjoyed the energy and we thought, hmm. Maybe we should do some more. Then the Black Bull gig came, which was uh, reviewed by the guy from The Guardian, Dave Simpson. Mm. He came up and he said he went to the lead sci-fi gig and was inspired. I said, really? He said, yeah. So he wrote, we've got a Guardian thing, which is very cool. And I thought, let's keep going. Then in time, we've got the opportunity to record the Five album up in Newcastle. Yeah. So are there any plans for future new recordings or an album? Well, well yes. Yes, there's, there's a new song which we're doing. Because we live a long way away, Brian and I are writing again, and he's done a song, Do I Belong? It's about someone in this country, how they feel about, do I belong with all the changes and all that sort of stuff. And I've been writing a lot of stuff. I've been very inspired, especially since my time alone, coming back using the resource of a book, rather than be, the, the, the whole function and method of writing the book has become a great resource to me to write new material. So, and I've come up with new ideas, so I want to, a triple level really, so it's writing for the band, writing for myself, writing for the, writing for the book. But I've got lots of things I want to do and share with the band and we're going to try and make a goal of trying to record something new. Mm. Because we're very inspired and the gigs have given us fire, because you need that liquid fire. After you do a gig you think, great stuff. And with the box set coming out, it's like, it's a, it's a, it's a stamp of existence and it's moving forward and it's celebrating good stuff. You know, I don't use the word celebrate too much, but it's, a, it's true that we're really happy about it. And it's inspired a lot of good stuff. So we'll hope the right, you know, we're getting some, some proceeds we get from this and, and other, other sources want to try and start recording some music. So hopefully we'll be able to do that after our next gig in Newcastle, which is on, on the 11th of November at Trillions. Uh, want to get into the studio and uh, rehearse some new material. Brian and I communicate through the digital airwaves with the horrendous dropouts. So we managed to pull something together on that. So if we can keep working like that, we'll get, we should be able to get an album of material together. And, it, and, in, and in the interim, it seemed like certain bands like Franz Ferdinand Spring to Mind. Oh yeah. Seem to have, of, their the music seemed to have echo or, or be influenced by yeah. the, the early Punishment Luxury stuff on Laughing Academy. I mean, yeah. that, do you take that as a kind of compliment? Uh, well, yeah, I don't mind. I mean, it's uh, like the, the other one I think I mentioned. Well, I, I never mentioned the Franz Ferdinand. You sort of mentioned it, or you mentioned it. And I did listen to it, I thought, oh, yeah. Yeah, I see what you mean. Take Me Out on the, and Puppet Life, the rhythm. The rhythm, that, yeah. That interesting... You see, I never, I never saw it, but I did see it when I was pointed to it. And I thought, well, that's, we're, we're all a bit eclectic. We're all a bit eclectic. We all pick and choose, not delivery, not try to pinch, or, and I don't think they would have either. But I think it might just been an influence at the time, maybe that's the way he plays as well, and stuff like this. And um, yeah, and if, it, if, it, if it's a good influence, and if it, if it influenced them, which it may have, um, good luck. I don't mind, I don't mind. It's, it's, it's what we do, I think, artistically, that matters. And if it, has, if it bounces in good places, well, on that high note, Neville, thank you very much for coming for here. Susie. I had my own mind, but in your 
not sure I was blinded. 